So my name is Shivam. Uh, I work at uh, the National University of Singapore as a research assistant. And uh, we do a lot of uh, Internet of Things research. So what I'm today going to be describing here is uh, one of the frameworks that we have built as a part of our research and uh, how we've been using it in making Internet of Things research easier and uh, making it more usable by, by general people. I, I mean people who don't really have the tech knowledge of it. Uh, I would like to start with a video of a demonstration that we had made. Uh, it's, uh, what you'll see in the video is that I go to a room, I tap on an NFC card, it automatically sets up the, envir uh, the environment for me, like all my IoT devices, like the light bulb and my Apple TV and whatnot. And then, uh, then something interesting happens that you can see. Yeah. So I'll show that first. So now as I tap on the, that card, the room, my room gets set up for me. So there's an Apple TV right beh beh behind me uh, that you can't really see right now. Then there are these lights that are also controlled by uh, control uh, and available on, on the Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. Then there's that drone that works on uh, Bluetooth connectivity. Uh, and there's this small little ball thingy. Uh, it's called a Spiro. And uh, that also talks to the phone uh, at the same time. Mm -hmm. So now the idea here is that I want to be able to use mutually incompatible devices to control other things. So right now, uh, like you will never be able to control a drone with uh, uh, a sphere ball, or you will not be able to control an Apple TV with a sphere ball. So here, what we're going to do is that the sphere ball is taken as, as the remote controller, and everything that I tap the phone to will be controlled by the Spiro then. <laughs> so now I tap the Apple TV, and now the ball gets hooked up with the Apple TV. Now, if I do like this, it plays and pauses the video. And at the same time, you can see that the lights are also connected at the same, uh, to the same setup. So every time the video plays, the lights dim, and every time the video uh, pauses, the lights turn on automatically. Now, you might have missed, but you. Yeah, I use the same Sphero like one of the orientations of this Sphero actually moves the video forward and the other orientation also moves the video backward mm. right. so now I want to be able to control the drone with the same ball so what I do is I tap the drone This is the MRT tag, if you guys are have been in Singapore for some time. So I pick up the ball, if I, once I tap on the ball, it turns on the drone. And then as I, uh, what the orientation of my ball is, the drone is also mirroring the same IMU. So this is one of the demos and one of the papers that we have published. Uh, we had published at NUS. Uh, so I just wanted to begin with a video because then it uh, helps to make things uh, helps it easier to understand what I'm going to talk about. Can you tell me how? 
so yeah, my name is Shivam. I work at the Felicity's Computing Institute, uh, National University of Singapore. And uh, that's actually my, since I stole these slides from my professor, so that's his name. <laughs> and I just didn't know how to get rid of it, so it's there. <laughs> uh, so, like everybody is now uh, trying to build context-aware systems. Like, uh, you, you want to personalize everybody's uh, experience as and when they move in all sorts of environment. But the problem is that uh, every new device that comes up in the market is using a different protocol, it's using some other type of uh, uh, channel uh, that you need to connect. Uh, it, it comes up with another proprietary API or SDK that you have to write software for to be able to communicate with it. So what we did was we, we created uh, a framework called Ambient Dynamics that helps you wrap all these proprietary SDKs into Dynamics plugins. Mm -hmm. So uh, also uh, now you can write plugins for all sorts of things. Like there's an indoor positioning thing. There's like uh, external sensors that are deployed anywhere. Then, uh, as you saw in the video, there, there, we have written a drone plugin that if you send commands, you can send commands to a drone using that. Then there's the Sphero plugin that helps you access data from the Sphero. Then there's an Apple TV plugin that helps you talk to Apple TV and other UPnP devices. Uh, so what Dynamics does is that it allows you and gives you an, a very easy way to actually talk to these devices without uh, knowing how exactly you talk to them. Like you don't actually have to get into the specifics of uh, how, the, how the Apple TV works or how the Sphere works. Since we try to provide these high level commands that you can send requests to or, uh, or try to access and get data back from the devices as well. Uh, one of the most interesting parts of Dynamics is that the plugins that we write are actually uh, dynamically deployed to Dynamics. So, uh, like once I try to access uh, uh, access the the Sphero, I, I I just make a request as a website or a, or uh, or an Android app that I want to access a Sphero. So give me the access to Sphero. So what it does is that it searches for Sphero in in a repository of plugins, and then it deploys it dynamically. So anybody who actually wants to uh, wants to be able to use it. You don't actually need to have the, the plugin pre-deployed or be a part of the app beforehand. So one of the good things about this is that anybody can write a plugin. And as long as I have uh, the URL to that plugin and I know what the ID of that plugin is, if, if you want to develop something, you just put that plugin out there and I want to use it, so I just make the request and it'll get deployed automatically. I don't have to update the software all over again or try to update the Android application that I have running. So this is kind of like the, the technical part of it. Uh, as, as, uh, as a plugin developer or as, a, or as an application developer, uh, we only need to use the top part of it, the Android application and the web browser part of it. Mm -hmm. So we have a couple of SDKs. If you want to do, if you want to develop a Python application that uses Dynamics capabilities, you can, we have the Python SDK. If you want to do a website that uses uh, Dynamics capabilities, you can, you can use uh, the Dynamics JavaScript SDKs, and similarly, we have SDKs for you to be able to write uh, Android applications. Now, the cool thing about this is that all all these all these uh, different platforms use the same plugin. So even if I want to access this Sphero on a website, I can just use my Dynamics S uh, SDK and I ask for the same thing that I want to use the Sphero, or I want to control your light bulb, right? or I want to do play a music on your on uh, on some sort of Bluetooth speaker. All of this can actually be done through the uh, through the Dynamics application. So, uh, similarly, we have all these. Uh, the JavaScript SDK uh, allows you to to connect uh, these plugins. One of the things that we had actually developed uh, for one of the demos was that you could. Uh, you, uh, you could go to one of these web pages, uh, give it uh, access of your Facebook albums, and then it retrieves your images. And then from the web page directly, you can start playing these images onto your Apple TV. So you don't actually have to go there, install new software, or try to even find out how I can uh, how I can access 
or send these images to my Facebook, uh, from my Facebook to the Apple TV or any other UPnP devices. So these are some of the features of our framework. So Dynamics runs as a lightweight background service. It's not at all heavy. It uses an OSGI mechanism. OSGI is a way of developing plugins that can be deployed uh, on the runtime. Uh, it supports native apps and browser-based web apps, Python apps. Uh, all the data that is actually passed between the application and the framework is a uh, plain old Java object. So you don't need any uh, special sort of uh, dependencies to be able to access it or try to parse it. Uh, we also have uh, the plugin sandbox. So once you write the plugin, you define what sorts of permissions it has. So anybody who, whenever some, some web app or an Android app actually requests the support for, for uh, a particular device, it, uh, uh, Dynamics will pop up and ask you, hey, that this particular guy is trying to access your media player. Do you, do you want to allow it? Now, once, now, that has like a couple of options, like, yeah, always allow that guy, or you can allow it for once, or just block him, or whatever. So, and uh, the, the plugin sandbox actually helps you maintain that. Uh, so, how, how can you actually develop these plugins? So, use, the, use our SDKs to develop plugins on whatever proprietary devices and software uh, hardware you have, uh, and just put it out there. It's all open source. And adding, adding, uh, requesting support for a particular type is as easy as doing this. You just do dynamics or add to tech support. This is the, uh, we had a barcode scanner plugin. So what it does is that if you want to be able to scan barcodes, you just do this in your application or in your uh, web, uh, uh, web page, and you get access to that. Now once you allow it, you can make requests to it to scan, scan the barcodes. Once you do that, it'll pop up the camera. And what you get as a result will be given back to you in the listener that you provide when you're trying to add the contact support. So this is another plugin that we have written. This, is, this uses the light sensor on your phone. So uh, web pages can now generally are not able to access the light sensor, right? Or uh, uh, for that matter, any other hardware that is available on your device. So you just add support for loss value. And then once the user approves of it, you start getting context events back from the, uh, from the Dynamics application to whatever application that you've written and now you can use it the way you want. So this is just a, an image of the fi uh, Facebook thing that we had developed. Uh, there's a share the screen button, so once you turn it on, it searches for all the UPnP and Apple Media devices that are there around you. And uh, once you do that, you can start you select, you get a list of all the available devices. Now you select the ones that you want to throw the throw the image to. The once you do that, when you, when you click on the photo, it goes straight to the uh, media render that you have. These are some of the plugins that we have, uh, like step detection, and media device discovery, barcode scanner, hard rates, new state plugin speech recognition plugin, all sorts of stuff. Uh, we have, uh, right now we have, we are, we have developed uh, activity recognition plugins. We have a, uh, 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 I forget it, okay. <laughs> so we have like, like hundreds of plugins right now because we are doing like, uh, we try to get into whatever, as and when new devices come into the market, like new IoT devices, like uh, an armband. You can see an armband that, that is there right now. So you can, you can, it recognizes all these gestures that you make. Like every time you do this, it'll tell you that this was done. So we have we have a plugin that helps you recognize that, and you can start to use these things and interconnect it, uh, and try to control uh, mutually incompatible devices and like seamlessly. It's amazing. Uh, there's one more video to finish it off. I'll show you. So what we're going to see in this video is that we started off with tap to interact, so you could tap on things and make them uh, talk to each other. But it's a little bit difficult because 
uh, you have, I mean, if you have like 15 devices, you're not going to start tapping everything in the room, right? So what we did was that we developed. Oh, oh. Right. So we developed a, a, a framework called Ambient Flow, which is based on Ambient Dynamics and the plugins. And what it does is that it helps you design your smart space. We use it as a smart space designer. We, we, we think that in the future, maybe 10 years down the line or 15 years down the line, there'll be people who just have this job of, to, of designing your ambient space for you. So this is a demo of that. Uh, you can see the video. So this is, wait, this one, all right, yeah, this one. <clears throat> so we start with a new graph. I want to start with, I want to control something or I want to create a situation where I control, use the sphere ball to do something. So I add, the zero plugin on this side. Now this zero plugin has a couple of inputs and a couple of outputs, right? So in this case, it has the collision sensor, like when, once you tap on it, it has the IMU values, like the accelerometer values, the pitch your roll, and it also has uh, a light uh, uh, yeah, inside it. So you can detect that and you can change that color as well. Now what I want to do is I want to control this light bulb from that sphero. So every time I change the orientation of the light bulb uh, of the sphero, I want the uh, color of the light bulb to change as well. So what I'll do is that I'll, I take the light plug in from that side, then I add it here, then I drag the output of this guy into the light plug in. Save this graph. Now the idea here is that this is a, a generic graph. Anybody who actually has a stereo and a light bulb can use this. Like just load this graph, scan, there, there'll be a barcode that'll pop up, scan uh, on your phone, and then it gets automatically mm -hmm. deployed, uh, deployed in your environment. So what I do now is I scan this barcode, which loads the graph on my phone. I, I can see this pairing so that whenever I want to use it again, I can just enter my password. So now this is setting it up. So as the orientation of the uh, of the sphere ball changes, the color changes. Now what I want to do is that I want to have the same color that the color uh, that the light bulb is be the color of the sphere that I have. So what I do is I take the output of this guy and then drag it back to my sphere, and then then I, I do the same thing, play it on the on the phone. Now it, I mean it might not really look like it because the light bulb is super bright, but uh, it actually has the same color. It's getting fed back into the sphere. So now this is a pre-made graph that we had. Uh, this is like this is what the what the yeah. So this is what we hope it'll be like for ambient designers uh, that you are trying to have that you're trying to have this this uh, this environment uh, pre-configured by somebody else and then you just come into there and start using it. So in this case, we have a Vimo plugin, uh, which is a motion sensor. We have a zero plugin to the ball. We have a the the ambient media plugin, then we have the light plugin, and all these are what you see here are translators. So what these translators do is 
that they translate the, the output of one device to another device. I mean, because ideally you would not know how to, how to uh, translate IMU data to light color, right? So we have all these translators that can do that for you. Play something in the phone, and you'll see that the light dims because uh, the movie's playing. The motion sensor is super, super uh, sensitive, so it kind of like meddles with what we are trying to do. Similarly, how you pick up the ball and then use it as a as a remote control for the Apple TV. So this was our latest publication that we had. It's called Ambient Flow. You can check it out like on our website or something. Uh, all right, thank you. This was my presentation. Thank you. <laughs>